Hello, and welcome to The Mastering Show. My name is Ian Shepard. I'm a mastering engineer, and I run the Production Advice website, aimed at helping you get the best results recording, mixing, and mastering your music. This episode, I want to talk about the different types of LUFS, of loudness units, because it seems that everybody is talking about LUFS, especially how loud they master their music, but there's a massive amount of confusion about it. I hear people saying everything from I do everything at minus six because it's EDM to I do everything at minus eight because that's what I hear you're supposed to do online to minus 11 is the perfect balance through to just master to minus 14. That's what the streaming services need. But here's the thing. Nobody ever says which type of LUFS they're talking about because many people don't realise there are actually three different kinds of LUFS measurement. And depending which one you measure, you can get very different results. So if you're a regular listener to the show, you'll probably have heard me say all of this stuff before. But I'm hearing these kind of questions so regularly, I have felt like it was really important to have a simple, concise summary that I can share with people. And maybe you know somebody who would find it helpful too. You probably know this already, but loudness units are basically very similar to RMS measurements that you may be familiar with, but they give results that are closer to what our ears hear. RMS tends to be very sensitive to bass, for example. Here are the three types of LUFS, loudness units, full scale. First of all, the momentary value. This reacts very, very quickly, and in my experience, it's probably too fast to be useful for music. John Tidy from reaperblog.net says that he finds it helpful for judging the loudness of speech, which is not something that I've tried to use it for. But as I say, I tend not to pay too much attention to it when I'm working on music. The second type is the short-term loudness. This is slower than the momentary value. It's actually averaged over three seconds. And it's the one that I find most similar to what you would see on a traditional RMS meter or an old style needle VU meter, which is actually what I was trained to use when I was mastering, and I still like to use a plug-in version of it. I find that the short-term loudness is really useful for getting an idea of the overall loudness of the song, for judging the differences between, for example, the verse and chorus, so the, the macro dynamic, the large scale variations in loudness, and also balancing the loudest moments, which is the technique that I recommend if you want to achieve consistent loudness over an album or between two different songs. So we've had momentary loudness, we've had short-term loudness, and the third type of LUFS value is the integrated loudness. This is an overall value for a piece of audio, and that could mean a short clip, it could mean a song, it could mean an entire program on... TV or radio, or a complete feature film, for example. And this integrated value is important because it's what streaming services use to decide when they should turn a piece of loud music or a loud piece of audio down in level. So most of them use a distribution loudness of minus 14 LUFS these days. If you master something that has an integrated loudness that is above minus 14, it will get turned down too minus 14. But because the integrated value is an overall number, it doesn't tell you anything about the internal dynamics of the song. It doesn't tell you what the loudest moment was, it doesn't tell you what the quietest moment was, and it doesn't tell you how much contrast there was between them. And that means that a measurement of minus 14 LUFS could mean that the song is minus 14 pretty much all the way through. For example, a full tilt rock song, or it could mean that there's a lot more variety in there and that it gets a lot louder at some points and it gets much quieter at other points. And this is why it's so crucial to find out which type of LUFS people are talking about when they say things like, I master everything at minus eight LUFS. If they mean they master so that the short-term loudness at the loudest moments is minus eight LUFS, that's pretty loud but it's not insanely loud. It's louder than I would recommend. I recommend you keep the loudest moments at minus 10, but you're welcome to choose whatever values work for you. So short term at the loudest moments is one thing, but if they mean they master everything to minus eight LUFS integrated, that is a really different prospect. 
that means that the loudest moments almost certainly go up to minus six and probably much, much higher, depending on the amount of variety between the loudest and the quietest moments. And that means that those really loud moments where it pushes well above minus eight are likely to be much more squashed and less varied in their dynamics than an example where the loudest moments are at minus eight. And that means that the, the comment or the opinion or oh, everything needs to be mastered at minus eight or minus six or whatever is actually ambiguous. If someone you respect gives you a piece of advice like that, it's absolutely crucial to find out, do they mean integrated or short term? If they mean integrated, they're recommending something substantially louder. And it's really important to understand that. I think it's also worth saying that we should be sceptical about claims like this. I've so often seen somebody say something like, oh, I master everything to minus 10 LUFS as a flippant throwaway comment. And because they're pushing back against the idea that you should master to minus 14, which I also think is misleading. We kind of come back to that in a second. But very often when you push somebody a little bit harder and get into this, they will often say, well, I don't actually master everything that loud. What they mean is that's the loudest I go when I need to. And that can apply even in just one genre where there's usually plenty of variety between songs and between artists. So I think it's super important to try and pin people down on this. It, it, it might feel <laughs> too nerdy or annoying to keep having to ask people this, but it really makes a huge difference. You know, in my experience, the difference between mastering the loudest moments to minus eight and mastering to an integrated value of minus eight can make three or four dB difference at the loudest moments. And that's a big difference, especially when you're mastering at these high levels anyway. The difference in the compression and dynamics needed to achieve minus 16 versus minus 14 LEOFS is probably not that huge, but the difference needed between minus 10 and minus eight or minus eight and minus six is massive. And I think it's also worth saying that it's much harder to achieve those really super high levels of loudness, especially keeping things sounding good. And some people would say that there's really not that much point given that the loudness is gonna be turned straight down again by those streaming services, but that's a different episode. So I mentioned in passing just there that there's a lot of pushback at the moment at the idea of mastering to minus 14 LUFS. There's lots of people saying, well, Spotify and YouTube and Tidal and Amazon Music all use a distribution loudness of minus 14. So anything that's louder than minus 14 integrated is going to be turned down to minus 14 integrated anyway, by default. So that's the loudness that you should aim for. And that might seem fairly logical, but people get really upset about that idea and with good reason. I think if we imagine two different songs that are going to be released as an EP and one of them is a full tilt rock tune and the other one is a simple acoustic guitar ballad, those two songs shouldn't be mastered to the same loudness. It makes no sense to master them both to minus 14 or minus 10 or minus 8 or any other integrated loudness because the thrashy rock tune should be, should sound louder than the acoustic guitar ballad. So the idea of mastering to any target loudness just doesn't make musical sense, let alone whether it makes technical sense or not. The second reason it doesn't make sense is that those songs will be normalised anyway. If you master both of them above minus 14, they will both get turned down to minus 14 anyway. And there's not a huge amount of difference between you doing that and the streaming service doing that. There's a slightly complicated caveat to that, which says that if your peak levels are also very high, there could be a downside to the streaming service doing it rather than you. But again, let's keep it simple for now. But here's the thing. Streaming services won't always make both of those songs minus 14. They'll only do it if it's in a playlist or you're listening in shuffle. On Apple Music and Spotify, and on Tidal, the loudness differences between songs in an album 
or an EP, a collection of songs that were uploaded to be listened to in sequence, is maintained. So if you choose to make the acoustic guitar ballad musically quieter than the thrashy rock tune, which makes sense to me, they'll maintain that difference. And there's research showing that that's the way that listeners prefer to hear them. It feels wrong to us for what is intended to be a quiet song to be played back as loud as a full tilt rock song or whatever. So those are two objections to mastering to a target loudness of minus 14 or any other value that I fully agree with. And the final reason that people get upset by this idea of mastering to a loudness target is that minus 14 often isn't loud enough. (laughs) And that comes from someone like me, who is a champion of dynamics, who loves balanced dynamics in music and hates the fact that everything is being mastered so loud. So what do I mean? How can I champion dynamics and say that minus 14 isn't loud enough? Part of the answer is that minus 14 LUFS integrated isn't loud enough for everything. It could be absolutely perfect for an acoustic guitar ballad, but probably not for a full tilt rock song. But there's also something important to be said about the process of making things louder. In order to achieve a loudness of minus 14 or above, you will probably have to use some compression and limiting. And the sound of that processing can be beneficial. It can help glue the song together. It can help get consistency of loudness, which can help the songs translate to the widest possible variety of listening situations. In many genres, we're used to the sound of bus compression, which is an important part of the sound and something that you will need to use if you want to achieve loudness levels higher than minus 14. So while I agree that there's no point in aiming for a specific target in any genre, it is true that if your goal is for something to sound loud and to feel right, then aiming for minus 14 might not encourage you to use enough compression and limiting. Having said that, I don't think you need to go much higher. If you take my suggestion as an example of minus 10 LUFS short term at the loudest moments, that means that if a song is minus 10 all the way through, its integrated loudness will be roughly minus 10. Whereas if the song is much more varied, has more contrast between the verses and the chorus or quiet sections and loud sections, then the integrated loudness will end up being somewhat lower. I have not yet come across a genre where I feel that it is necessary or beneficial to go above minus 10 LUFS at the loudest moments. You can achieve the intensity and density, the pressure sound of, in inverted commas, loud genres at minus 10 with some careful use of the processing. And to me, that's an ideal situation because you get to get your cake and eat it. You get to achieve the sound that you're looking for whilst also retaining enough microdynamics, enough peak to loudness ratio, enough crest factor to keep space and bite and impact in the sound without having to use extreme limiting. Again, these are my recommendations. You may feel different. So exactly what loudness you decide is the short term loudness you won't go beyond is up to you. But coming back to the central point of this episode, whatever that loudness is, in my opinion, you should decide it using short term values, not integrated values, and not really worry about what those integrated values are. They're interesting because they tell you what will happen when you listen to something on a streaming service with a maximum distribution loudness and they enable you to preview that result. They enable you to say, well, okay, how will it sound if my song is played at minus 14 next to this song played at minus 14 or that song played at minus 14? And by the way, the easiest way to achieve that for yourself is to head over to loudnesspenalty.com, which I set up with meter plugs and enables you to do exactly that in the browser without uploading your files. So let's try and summarize this. When you hear somebody say, I always master my music to X LUFS value. It's really important to find out or figure out whether they mean the integrated loudness, the overall loudness, or the loudest moments of the song, the short term loudness, because it makes a huge difference in the overall result. And when you're mastering your own music, it doesn't make any sense at all to aim for a particular target. I think I can sum this whole thing up by saying that the integrated LUFS value is the result of the mastering process, 
not the goal of the mastering process. If you aim for minus 14 or you aim for minus 8 or you aim for any other number, in my experience, you're likely to be disappointed or frustrated or both. Whereas if you do some careful listening and some careful testing and decide I'm comfortable with the loudest movements of my song being at this short term loudness level and I'll balance everything else musically to that, including the other songs, you will end up with integrated loudness results that cover a variety of ranges depending on the material, but that work well next to each other because the loudest moments are at a matched loudness level that won't get turned down too much by online streaming services if you exceed their distribution loudness, that translate fantastically well to all formats, streaming, vinyl, CD, you name it, that are easier to achieve, require less processing, and sound better. How's that for a sales pitch? So, there you go. I could probably have made that even shorter and more concise, but I do think it's worth digging into the details on these topics to an extent. Hopefully it was still helpful for you and will help you understand better what people might mean when they throw around numbers about the loudness that they master to and what is needed in different genres and help you get better results at the same time. So I hope that was helpful or interesting. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a rating or review and tell your friends. And if you think there's someone you know who would find this episode useful, please share it with them. Thanks as always to John Tidy for editing and mixing the show. Thanks to Kaylee Law for letting us use his music. And thanks to you for listening. <laughs>